When Gandhi was asked once to comment on European civilization, his quip was, it would be a very good idea. When asked today about our views on the European Union, I think we can be excused to reply in a similar fashion. What a splendid idea it would be if we could only pull it off. United only name, the European Union is, I'm afraid, in a process of disintegration as we speak. With the commitment and determination of uh, a termite colony, which is eating into the foundations, very soon there will be nothing left but an empty shell to remind us of the lofty ideal that used to be the European Union. In Agatha Christie novels, when the reader comes across, in the prologue, a group of characters, upper-class characters usually, that are congregating some chateau, the reader knows what to expect, a series of murders. Similarly today, when we hear that our European politicians are gathering today, or together, we know what to expect, a comedy of errors, which will be wrapped up in uh, triumphant rhetoric, but which very soon will prove to be nothing more than dangerous, harmful waffle. To err is human. But to mess up spectacularly, we need an elite made up of prime ministers, presidents, ministers, apparatchiks, uh, opinion makers, who are determined not to face up to a systemic crisis systematically. Alas, at least now we have enough evidence that renders all such denial inexcusable. Humanity has not surprised itself very often, but it has done so twice in the past. Once in 1929, and yet, yet again, more recently in 2008. 1929 ought to have taught us a very simple binary twin lesson. First, that the first victim of such a crisis is the common currency. It was the gold standard in 1929, it is the euro today. The second victim is, of course, truth and civility. Once such a, a terrible crisis hits the world, a Hobbesian war of all against all is unleashed on an unsuspecting humanity. And the first victim is our capacity to recognize the systemic crisis we are in as a systemic crisis. And therefore, it renders us incapable of accepting our responsibility for at least a portion of that crisis. Thrillers begin with some cunning detective who is unmasking one shady character after the other. But good thrillers, I submit to you, do not end with the unveiling of the perpetrator. They go one step further. They reach the momentous moment when the cunning de detective un inadvertently unmasks himself. Bewildered, he's staring at his own image in the mirror. This crisis is having a similar effect on all of us. Our masks are falling. Unscrupulous bankers, inane politicians, conniving entrepreneurs, cynical academics, uncritical citizens, who are all being unmasked. But as their masks keep falling, the dejection is becoming generalized. Meanwhile, the human costs are mounting up. And the only way of making sense of them and measuring them sensibly is by means of counting lost generations. It is time to transform Europe and to be transformed in the process. In the end, it wasn't even close. A momentous victory for the No campaign and Greece's radical left-wing government. Not a no to Europe, they said, but a no to further austerity and recession. This morning, the Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras met the leaders of all political parties, uniting, for now, to try to save the Greek economy. There is no time to lose, and other European countries have sounded sceptical at best. But one leading Greek minister told the BBC they should listen to the Greek people. Their message is twofold. One, that they fully support the government, and B, that they want a deal, a more balanced deal, 
because the vast majority, irrespective of the, whether they vote yes or no, they want to stay in the euro, they want to stay in Europe. Another prominent figure in this Greek drama has resigned. Yanis Varoufakis said he'd been made aware that many of his fellow Eurozone finance ministers would prefer him not to be in their meetings, and the Prime Minister thought that could be helpful. I shall, he said, wear the creditors loathing with pride. But now the government needs to move on quickly. So a changing of the guard and a gesture to European politicians who've reached the end of their tether with Greece. It's also a chance for the government here to betray this as a fresh start. But all the while and more immediately, what on earth is going to happen to the Greek banks? Because they're still closed, people are still queuing at cash machines and the money is about to run out. This is the biggest time pressure there is. If there is no sign of, uh, of uh, an agreement, which I hope will not be the, the, the case, then we will have to extend the actual situation as it is. So closed banks, closed stock exchange and capital controls. So Greece waits and watches. Spiros has been selling flowers on the street outside Parliament for 30 years. He's seen crises come and go, but nothing quite like this. I saw quite a lot and uh, today I feel uh, very proud that I am Greek. Uh, that's all. Pride, I think, is the, the, the word. But now the government here is relying on governments and institutions elsewhere in Europe to give it another chance. A deal involving less austerity and more debt relief and an agreement to keep the banks from collapse. It's quite a gamble. Personally, I won't sign another extend and pretend. Uh, I'm allergic to extending and pretending. If there's a yes vote, come Monday night, you will not be finance minister. I will not. There won't be a yes verdict. I am quite confident that the Greek people have had enough of extending and pretending. Okay. Like the rest of the world, by the way. You personally won't sign a deal without debt reorganization as being part of it. That is no, I prefer, to, I, prefer, I prefer to cut my arm off. Red lines by necessity are inflexible. But our red lines and their red lines are such that there is common ground. I wish that we had the drachma. Make no mistake, this is not the statement that I want the drachma. I wish we had the drachma. I wish we had never entered this monetary union. And I think that deep down, all member states of the Eurozone would agree with that now. Because it was very badly constructed. But once you're in, you don't get out without a catastrophe. We have the right to be heard. And we have the right to challenge the logic of a program that has clearly failed. This crisis that began in 2008, 9, 10, instead of helping us come closer together, it is creating centrifugal forces that is making the political process of unifying even harder. And that is something that should, we should lose sleep over. As Germans, as Greeks, as Portuguese, as Finns, as Slovaks, as French. We will compromise, we will compromise, and we will compromise in order to come to a speedy agreement. But we're not going to end up being compromised. I'm not going to give you a press conference while I'm trying to escape.